Professional duties, ethics and the courts is the topic of this lecture. Professional duties in particular is critical to your careers in the workforce and I wanted to create this lecture a few years ago because I realised that for many students this is the only course in your entire degrees where you look at the law and that nowhere else did you consider important legal principles like the duty to avoid professional negligence, uh, corruption and other important legal principles that have direct impacts on your day-to-day -day work in, uh, as professionals. So this is the 12th lecture in our course and really the last substantive lecture before we wrap up the course next week. In outline, what I want to cover are first three problems but I'm going to interweave them with the professional duties. So. I've got a case study or a problem about professional negligence by a council, a local government, in dealing with contaminated land. Also, a problem involving corruption from Wollongong City Council in New South Wales. And also a problem involving confidentiality and whistleblower protection. This is from a um, former Queensland government employee, Simone Marsh, and a ABC Four Corners documentary from a few years ago. So those problems I'm going to interweave with looking at professional duties because each one brings out different aspects of your professional duties and the dilemmas that you face in the workforce. Finally, I'm going to deal at the end of the lecture with just a brief overview of courts and duties as an expert witness, but that's not a major focus. The, the main thing I want to unpack in this lecture is the professional duties that you have in the workforce. So let's look at the first of those problems, Alec Finlayson and Armadale City Council. This is a problem involving negligence and misleading and deceptive conduct and also breach of contract. So Armadale is a city in New South Wales and it's about what 600 kilometres south of Brisbane. If we zoomed in on Armadale, the site that I'm going to talk about is in the western portion of the city. So you can see Armadale there spreading out in the western section of the city just near the rail line. So I'll change my um, pointer. So we've got a rail line here and you can see the city spread around. Uh, also notice that there's this creek that runs down here, joins into a main river flowing through Armadale. So that's the headwaters of a creek just there, and I'm going to show you some pictures. Across the rail line, there's a uh, golf course, but yeah, surrounded by housing. So if we zoom in again, in, in close up, the site is, this is an image of the site from a couple of years ago, and you can see the houses, the residential estate that's been built, the cul-de-sacs. I'll show you some pictures on the ground of that in a moment, but that's it in overview. This is a map from a report from 1993 showing the location of a timber treatment yard that had been um, present on the site uh, in the uh, 70s, uh, 80s uh, and had caused extensive contamination of the site. So we'll just go back so you can get an idea. So you can see the houses that are there. Now this map overlays the houses and the cul-de-sac. So I'll just go back, see there's a cul-de-sac here. Well that cul-de-sac is here on the map and there's a, a range of houses that are spread around as well but the um, overlaid on the street map are where the timber piles were on this uh, timber treatment yard. So this is a picture again of the same site. You can see the um, rail line there to the southwest of the site and these are this is an image from 1976 showing yeah the stacks of timber on the site there's a building down in the bottom portion of the site that I'll show you some pictures of in a moment uh, where the timber treatment actually occurred so they would they would uh, treat the timber with uh, arsenic and a range of other uh, CCA a range of other chemicals to stop termites and, and other things from uh, eating the timber. And then when they had um, put the 
chemicals into the timber in this um, plant in the um, bottom right of the site, they would then take the timber out to dry around the site. So this is that building in the um, bottom right corner of the property. So this is the, the building uh, in 1968. Now notice there's this um, big cylinder thing behind the building. So that was a 75 foot cylinder for timber impregnation. And what they would do is put timber in that. And here's another image of it from a different angle from a newspaper clipping from 1968. So they would put timber in that and then pour the chemical, fill it with chemicals and then pressurize it to drive the chemicals into the timber. So that was the basic way that they operated. And here's some of the um, containers that they used for uh, storing the chemicals on the site. So lots of chemicals, lots of really nasty stuff was used. And here's an advertisement for the um, new timber treatment plant in 1968 saying that this will uh, the plant will treat uh, round timbers with creosote using vacuum pressure uh, and it will produce transmission poles for electricity supply and telecommunications, farm fencing timbers and farm building tim timbers. And yeah, it talks about its capacity and the like and how big the site would be. So that's it back in 1968. Then this is a newspaper from 1976. So this was the front page of the Armadale Express in 1976 where uh, it was claimed... <laughs> Um, by the timber plant, basically a whole heap of chemicals escaped from that big um, pressure unit. So I'll read you the headline, thousands of gallons of deadly poison were released from Martin's Gully into Martin's Gully Creek on Monday morning after someone broke into Hassel's impregnation plant. And um, the work of the saboteur was discovered at 7.30 a.m. and thousands of gallons had spilled from the creek. I mean, reading this story and also uh, knowing of the later history where the ne the really bad practices that were occurring on the site became known, it really strikes me that this um, story is a bit of a false um, presentation from the, or in, basically a bit of false reporting by the timber plant. It, it seems that there was a, um, a, an ac accidental release from the timber plant that they claimed was the work of someone coming onto it to avoid responsibility for it. That's my take on this. But essentially, there was a big release. For whatever reason, there was a big release of chemicals from the site. You can actually see the site in the distance there. So this is the headwaters of that creek that then flows into the uh, river that runs through Armadale. And here's a picture of that um, truck. This uh, has been given, these images were given to me by Armadale City Council a few years ago because I became interested in this, the litigation about this. You can see the timber stockpiles there in the distance and there's the truck of council workers trying to clear up the, the poison. Okay, so with that background, so this is uh, 1976 and the council knew full well about the um, practices of what was going on on the site. So they knew that a lot of bad chemicals were used. They knew, they knew there'd been spills. In fact, they knew a lot of things about bad practices that are beyond just this spill in 1976. But then in the late 1980s, the site was sold and houses were built on it. So here's a picture from a valuer's report. In, it, it ended up going to court in 1995. And this was a, a picture from a valuer's report from the federal court file. So I asked the federal court for some image, images from it or copies of the report and they gave them to me. So here's the houses built on the site. And again, another image of um, some units that have been built there. And again, more images from the site. So you can read about this because I made it a, it's a really interesting example of uh, bad practice and why we now have contaminated land legislation, for instance. So remember back when we looked at the Environmental Protection Act, that we learned about the contaminated land register and the environmental management register. So those uh, 
components of our legal system came in the 1990s after cases like this really showed that we had significant problem with land contamination and often properties were being developed where it wasn't obvious that there's uh, contamination of the site and you would have had to have known what's happened in the past to be able to identify that maybe there's a risk of contamination on the site but because of cases like this uh, states like New South Wales and Queensland created contaminated land registers so this um, development occurred before the contaminated land registers became common and on my website I'll just read you the history of the site so in 1967, the council approved the construction of a timber treatment plant on the site. The plant included a high pressure cylinder, which was 22 meters long, to impregnate telephone poles and other timber with creosote, a wood preservative containing um, polycyclic aromic hydrocarbons, which have a number of toxic effects, including carcinogenicity. The timber treatment plant commenced operation in 1968, and um, the following decade, in, during the following decade, multiple pollution incidents at the plant were recorded by council officers. So this was all on the council files. Steps agreed between the council and the plant operator to rectify the problems proved inadequate and there were ongoing complaints from neighbours and creosote was found in a creek some two to 300 metres away and in the road adjacent to the plant. In 1970, council approved plans for the installation of two new tanks um, containing tantalith, a toxic complex salt containing arsenic and uh, in the form of copper chrome arsenate. And then in 1976, around 3,000 gallons or 11,000 litres of copper chrome arsenate escaped from the pressure cylinder and heavily contaminated the site and a section of the nearby creek. The timber treatment plant operated until 1979 and 1980 when the plant was relocated. Now, as a result of the timber treatment plant's operation, the site was seriously contaminated with a combination of creosote and copper chrome arsenate. And uh, essentially a residential development was approved um, by the council in 1982. Uh, and that basically blew up in the council's faces uh, in 1990 when serious contamination of the land was revealed. And then there was litigation against the building the company that had um, the, the company that had contaminated the site was long gone and had been wound up so you couldn't sue them and the company that had sold the contaminated land also had been wound up and so couldn't be sued the council was the last um, effectively the last person standing so they were sued and held liable for negligence because they should have known about the contamination from simply from their files. The story I was told by um, a council officer was it was quite sad that essentially a new planner had uh, been just joined the council and he assessed it and he wasn't aware of the contamination and didn't wasn't aware of the files on the on the property so approved the, the development uh, despite essentially a lot of council records showing the contamination. And what had occurred on the site was, was really, really bad practice. So during the trial, an employee, a former employee at the timber treatment plant gave evidence at the trial which described the complete lack of any proper disposal system for waste on the site. And one of the jobs he and other workers did was to get rid of waste from the pressure cylinder. And he gave evidence that it was tipped into 44 gallon drums and then dumped elsewhere on the site. Uh, and he said that disposal of the waste around the site was rampant and that it was the only way they got rid of the liquid. And he described in his evidence how often uh, it was quite hard to find a place to dispose of it because there was so much of it um, sp spread out across the ground that was just wet and soaking in. So essentially they were disposing of all of this um, really bad, these really bad chemicals directly onto the site. So this litigation ultimately uh, found that the council was liable for a breach of its duty of care and awarded $1.5 million in damages and interest to the company, the building company that had bought the property and then developed it 
and that decision was upheld on appeal. So you can have a look at that case study on my website and the decisions and uh, the federal court gave me a lot of documents in relation to it. But the for those of you who are going to go and work for councils, uh, it is a significant issue that you can be the council can be liable for negligent decisions, and this uh, case really highlights many issues about the um, environmental regulation generally and how the modern system that we've got for all its imperfections, for all of the problems that I've talked about during the course for issues like regulatory capture and you know, all of those issues, the system that we've got is an important safety net for our community. And we have moved forward from 30 years ago when there were a lot of really bad practices and a lot of contamination occurred and you know we're still de dealing with the legacy of those bad events now but it highlights really why uh, we now have a you know a much more extensive regulatory system than we had in the past so that's armadale or sorry alec finlayson case and you can read about that as i said on my website now, can I just draw out a few duties related to that case? Uh, the first is one that I just wanted to touch upon. So uh, in the handout I've given you, I've identified nine major duties and I've made the point at the start that you know, as a professional during your careers, you, of course, you have the general duty to comply with the law. So you have... A duty, for instance, if you steal something from your workplace, you can be charged with theft and, you know, go to jail for that. What I've done in this uh, on the handout and what I want to do in this lecture, though, is not you know, give you a general overview of what the law requires you to do on things like theft, but to focus on nine uh, issues that are particularly important for professionals yeah, environmental professionals as well as um, in the workplace so you'll see some of the duties involve things like work health and safety requirements as well as um, workplace bullying and harassment and those sorts of things i started the nine broad obligations within, within the context that you have to comply with the law the first duty that i identified as being really important for you as a professional is a duty to comply with contract terms. So typically when you're in a consultancy, you'll normally enter into a written contract to provide your services for a specified fee. So let's just say you're working as a town planner or an engineer or environmental manager, whatever field you're in, you know, you're working for a consultancy, a developer approaches your firm to provide advice on a proposed development and you're gonna write a report and your firm quotes $10,000 to write the report. And you will typically have a standard contract that you give them setting out um, contractual terms. So in that is typically things like uh, liability limitation clauses. So they, you'll say you're only liable for the price of the contract, you're only liable to the person you're providing services to, no one else can rely upon your report. Those sorts of things are about limiting your liability. So standard contracts are just bread and butter of the workplace. So the basic duty you have is to comply with the contract. So you will have... Um, you'll set out what services you're going to provide. So if you're a town planner and you're to provide advice on you know, whether an application is needed and then if so, um, to lodge, prepare and lodge the application. So when you, your basic obligation is to do that and provide the report to your client. And when you do that, you are meeting your contractual terms and then they pay you your money. So that's how you generate your fees. So that's your basic obligation uh, in that sense fulfilled. It's really important in uh, a lot of um, professional services to be careful with how you define the scope of your services. So 
what exactly you are providing advice on um, because not only does that then address your contractual terms so you know what you are being asked to do but it also then can affect the next few duties about um, avoiding negligence um, but the first duty to be aware of is you have to comply with your contractual terms and it's typical to have standard contracts which limit liability and in the footnotes on the handout there's a couple of examples with litigation around uh, consultants who've been sued by purchases of land where say a contaminated land report has been prepared and it did not identify contamination and then um, a purchaser of the land tries to sue the consultants and in the footnote that I provided there the case that I provided the the liability limitation clause prevented the litigation from being successful because the purchaser should not have relied upon or could not um, have properly relied upon the report that um, was prepared by the consultant for the um, sent the seller of the land so I won't dwell on that anymore um, contracts are often quite complex to look at but your basic duty is to comply with your contractual obligations linked to that is a duty to take reasonable care or avoid professional negligence and this is really really significant for you as a professional and a significant uh, aspect of your professional practice will be documenting what you've done what you've checked uh, what you didn't didn't do what you did do and what you didn't do to prepare your report and the reason you're doing that is to protect yourself and your firm against potential later claims for negligence so if you for instance checked on a particular date a um, on you did an online search and the results you found was x then you should document that um, as part of your good um, practice in preparing a report for a client because if it later turns out that you know the the search um, you know there's a question about whether you pre perform the search properly or whether you performed it at all uh, then having it documented is going to be critical to, de to defending uh, a claim for negligence so yeah as a consultant you have a duty to exercise reasonable care in the provision of all services you provide to clients including professional advice that you give and you can be liable for damages if a client relied on your advice and you failed to take reasonable care now what is reasonable is a matter of fact and degree in the circumstances of each case typical indicators of situations calling for greater care include increasing risk or potential financial loss for a client and complex problems that require expertise to understand now making basic errors such as failing to read the definitions of a planning scheme when advising a client on the requirements for a development approval under the planning scheme are very likely to be regarded as negligent so basic errors like that uh, are highly likely to be uh, regarded as negligent um, and yeah it's it's a complex difficult task that you face and in my experience often uh, you know clients can be really demanding and unreasonable with what they want you to do in the time and space available I in my experience it's the unreasonable clients are the ones that will cause problems down the track because they're the ones that will complain that you didn't get something right even though you know when you were doing the work for them they were complaining about your fees and telling you to limit what you do and you know not to you know keep checking something or not to do particular searches because it was too expensive you know if it then turns out that uh, down the track those searches were necessary and you haven't documented carefully that you told the client you know to do those searches or do those checks and they told you not to if you haven't done done those sorts of things the client will still turn around and and sue you those unreasonable people um, unreasonable clients uh, tend to be the problematic ones in my experience so this lecture has had quite a few um, students respond quite strongly to it in the sense that it really resonates with them from their own experience in the workforce 
and Catherine Andrews, who was a town planner who did this course back in 2012, emailed me, uh, and I'm using just a quote from her with her permission. She uh, wrote to me to say, the duty of care and professional indemnity topics are very relevant to the reality of a private consultancy or working in government. So that's great that it is included in the teaching syllabus. It is always a little daunting preparing written advice to a client, especially when it guides potential purchase. To be exceptionally careful about what I put into writing was emphasized from the very beginning, as well as ensuring detailed notes were recorded on file after a phone conversation where advice was given in order to protect both the company financially and in terms of reputation. Uh, at the moment, it is vital to keep a record of the relevant sections of the draft city plan when advising clients because they're subject to change once the public advertising has finished. And professional indemnity is also why counsel is often reluctant to put anything in writing. Yeah, so, so often as a consultant, you might ask uh, a counsel for what you need to do. And, and typically, governments will say, well, we can't tell you, you have to work it out. And one of the big reasons for that is governments are, and government employees are frightened about being sued if they get the advice wrong. So keeping notes, keeping good files is um, bread and butter. What I often advise when I uh, give training, I give training on to different companies about um, environmental law and um, things like um, negligence and the like. And what I often say is um, it's it's important that you develop good systems for um, record keeping. Catherine here talks about keeping detailed file notes. I uh, think that that's a good idea, but I also suggest um, sending regular emails to clients because if you're told something on site or uh, in a phone conversation, uh, that disappears unless you record it somewhere in a document. So if you've been told by a client that, say you're looking at a site and um, you raise an issue and the client says, no, we don't want you to um, look at that. Um, we're getting someone else to look at that issue. Let's just say you were on site and you were told that. Then my suggestion would be you get in the habit of then uh, sending an email to that person who's told you that just in a nice way, but just say, you know, uh, dear, you know, John, it was nice to meet with you on site this morning and discuss the proposed development. Uh, you said to us that we shouldn't consider the issue of X because someone else is dealing with that. I just wanted to confirm that that's the case. Um, we're happy to deal with it if you if you need us to need us to, but otherwise we're just going to leave it out of the material we consider. So a nice email like that then records it, and uh, there can't be any dis. Well, um, if there's going to be a dispute, they should raise it immediately, and. Uh, good emails like that and then the company then or your firm has to have ways of organizing your emails so you'll, you'll put your emails in a particular file to record them for future reference because you know if this if it becomes a dispute in uh, companies normally have six years to if someone suffers uh, damage due to negligence you normally have about six years to sue now if that ha you know, if you if your firm gets sued six years later because you failed to consider this issue that you were told not to consider, and you may well have left, um, someone else could be dealing with the file. It, so, when you're documenting uh, these things, you have to prepare. You have to write your files for someone else to uh, look at in the future. So, uh, good. <laughs> Um, record keeping like that is a, a really important uh, habit to develop. So the next duty that I wanted to mention is misleading and deceptive conduct. So you've got a duty to take reasonable care. So that's the second main duty, the professional negligence. Related to that, but a different duty, is a duty um, not to engage in misleading or deceptive uh, conduct which is an important duty that's come from the 1970s. It was originally in uh, national legislation called the Trade Practices Act, and then that was replaced in 2010 by the Competition and Consumer Act. So it's called the Australian Consumer Law now, and it used to be Section 52. 
And in the Alec Finlayson case, it was in the federal court because there was a claim for misleading and deceptive conduct. And that's what that's why it was in that. Um, and misleading and deceptive conduct was part of that litigation. So uh, under the Australian consumer law, a person must not in trade or commerce engage in conduct that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. So this is different to taking reasonable care, but often factually they occur very close together. So uh, trade or commerce covers most commercial activity, including work done by a consultant for a fee. Deceptive, what is misleading and deceptive are largely tautologies because they both share a common meaning of um, to lead to error. It's unnecessary to prove there was an intention to mislead or deceive or that the conduct in question actually deceived or misled anyone. The conduct must be viewed as a whole and context um, is important. Um, but uh, yeah, and a rep misrepresentation um, may amount to misleading conduct, even if it is uh, literally true. Um, a statement that is half true may be, may be misleading uh, and a false statement that is featured prominently in written um, advertising may be, may be misleading, even if it's qualified elsewhere in the text. So a statement that is false, that is untrue, is necessarily misleading, but um, simply because something is true, it doesn't mean that it, it, it can't also be misleading. Something can be literally true, but misleading in context. So if you breach section 18 of the Australian consumer law, then there's a range of remedies, including damages. So those are important um, principles and the sort of classic situation that um, this can be uh, to you know in, uh, affect you as a consultant is that uh, you give a report which uh, glosses over problems that you see with the site and then someone uses your report relies upon your report to do something with the site so you are, you know you're acting for a client who wants to develop a site and you see some some significant issues but you gloss over them because your client would be unhappy with you if you don't basically say this is a great development so that sort of situation is a classic you know misleading and deceptive you haven't you might have told the literal truth but if you left out problems that you knew existed uh, and so your report has the impression that the site is all fine then that is sort of classic misleading and deceptive conduct so that emphasizes the importance of disclaimers in your report and also basically if there are if there are problems that you identify then you should be um, making them clear in your report and not just glossing over them so misleading and deceptive conduct is an important uh, or avoiding misleading and deceptive conduct is an important duty Related to that, I just mentioned that there's also a lot of criminal offences for providing false or misleading to environmental regulators. So these are very, it's very close to misleading and deceptive conduct, but misleading and deceptive conduct normally involves consumers rather than regulators. But if you, for instance, prepare a report which gets submitted to the Department of Environment and Science under the Environmental Protection Act, and your report is false or misleading, then you can be prosecuted for committing an offence. So again, if you're aware of problems on a site and you just leave them out because you don't want to create problems for your client or your client doesn't want you to refer to those things, then that is a sort of red flags coming up for me as a lawyer that what you're engaging in there is false or misleading um, providing false or misleading information to the regulator. And just as an example of that, recently in February, uh, the Adani mining company that's developing the Carmichael mine ple pleaded guilty to giving false or misleading documents to the Department of Environment and Science uh, related to um, the um, mine and what it was doing on the mine. So that's just a recent uh, example of a company being prosecuted uh, consultants are relatively rarely prosecuted. My view is uh, regulators should prosecute consultants a lot more because a lot of, there's a lot of false and misleading 
information given to regulators by consultants. And yeah, I, I believe it's an area where we should see much more, uh, many more prosecutions in the future. And I don't want it to be you. So for Section 480 of the Environmental Protection Act, here's the offence. A person must not give to the administering authority um, a, a document containing information that the person knows or ought reasonably to know is false or misleading in a material particular. So, yeah, that's a serious offence. But can I just give you a reality check? Misleading and deceptive conduct or, and false and misleading information, while they're unlawful, they're widespread in the environmental consultancy sector. Clients often pay you a lot of money to support their applications and consultants do what they're paid to do, support the application. And uh, generally, um, you know, people that are engaging in dodgy conduct, they know it and they cover their tracks well, so they're rarely called out. They cloak everything in my opinion, or they try and couch it as a, a legitimate expression of professional opinion. And this was a, a quote from an, an email that I received from a um, consultant, um, Ray Madgewelsh. Uh, he was a consultant in, in New South Wales. I've put up his story on the Blackboard site because he, he sent me an email and then he followed up with explaining his consultancy experience. And it's a fascinating story, a very sad story. It's rare to actually have someone speak out about their experience in you know these bad situations. So Ray spoke about uh, how favorable reports are not requested of consultants. Uh, they're not even generally discussed. They're just expected and they're delivered. Consultants will write what is needed to be written without any instruction or direction from their client in order to facilitate continued operations. And if you do what you need, sorry, if you do what is needed, you get more work. If you don't, you get cut. That, that's the reality. You know, if you're a consultant, you're in business to stay in business. And it's obvious to you that if you, you know, a client comes to you with wanting to do this particular project, it's obvious what the client wants. They want you to support the project. If you point out all of these problems with the project and you don't feel you can support it, well, they're not going to come back to you. They'll go to someone else and get a report from someone else who will support it. And similarly, if a law firm is brief briefing you to provide advice, you know, they might give you regular clients and you don't want to annoy them or, you know, get them offside. So there's a huge pressure on you as a consultant to basically support the project. And it's very rare that they would ever be as crass as to offer you money to do that. Uh, they basically just, you know, pay your invoice, but it's all done on the basis that this is expected, but you don't speak about it. And Ray went on, unscrupulous practitioners are prepared to risk getting caught for the incredible returns that you can make getting involved in highly profitable industries. And yeah, the people that are doing dodgy reports, um, they realize they can write pretty well what they want in the EIS and including misleading and deceptive conduct because they, they won't get caught or prosecuted. Um, yeah, because basically the departments don't prosecute for these things. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an area that our regulators could do much. You know, if, if I was to say one thing we could do to fix our current um, regulatory system, one of the big things would be to prosecute consultants for false and misleading information. Because if you do that, it means that the good consultants, the ones that are doing the right thing, that want to, you know, want to actually give legitimate reports, they don't get left high and dry. Because if, you know, if they're raising issues, um, but other consultants, you know, are, are willing to play along, then the good ones don't get don't get work because companies you know don't want them to um, say why um, you know don't want them to give a, a negative report so this is in areas about particularly environmental management there are some areas where consultants will give um, reports and and clients will want you to give a, a proper report and I'm thinking particularly of areas involving say work health and safety or I've got a, a, fr a really good friend of mine 
who is a geotechnical engineer who works for a lot of um, big deep mines and he uh, because his reports you know if, if he gets it wrong people can die and mining companies will be prosecuted for work health and safety breaches um, he can you know he gives reports that are legitimate and there's no you know any anyone that gives pressure on him to not put in um, you know safety issues into his report he just re would refuse to do it so there are areas where um, there's an expectation that you'll give the right answer, sorry, the you know a truthful answer, even if it's problematic for the client. But they, in my experience, they typically involve real safety risks. Environment and, and planning issues aren't in that category. Clients really just want you to do what is necessary to get their projects approved and you know, then they'll sell the project or, you know, they'll move on and, you know, no one expects to get prosecuted for that sort of stuff going into applications. So, yeah, it's a, uh, re it's a huge problem for the consultancy sector and the whole regulatory system. So I've put uh, his Ray's story um, as a handout. Just it's, a, it's a long story and I didn't want to get bogged down in it, um, but have a read of it. Moving on, uh, in my experience, there are ethical consultants who refuse to simply do what their clients want, but they're a small minority and they lose out to consultants who simply do what the client wants. And government regulators never prosecute consultants for fraud or misleading conduct, and, but I think they should. Um, so just as an example, in my experience as a barrister in litigation against large coal mines, Groundwater consultants uh, employed by the mining industry construct groundwater models working backwards from the desired outcome that there is impacts only within a mine site and then no impacts or negligible impacts outside a mine site on neighbouring land. And then governments simply waive the projects through with conditions uh, for ongoing monitoring. That's, that's been my strong um, experience. That's the experience I've had in in looking at groundwater models for you know these really big mines that I've worked on in the last few decades, uh, consultants' reports. Once you start to dig into them, you see a whole heap of problems with them, and I really think that groundwater models uh, done by the coal mining sector they really work backwards from that uh, no impacts outside or only negligible impacts. So the next problem I want to look at involves conflicts of interest and corruption and it involves Wollongong City Council in New South Wales and why I'm going to use it is because there's a really good report was written about corruption at the council. So Wollongong is a city uh, a couple of hours south of Sydney and you can go onto the Wollongong City uh, website this is just a screen grab from it that I've taken and Back in 2008, there were huge problems with corruption in the council and it went to New South Wales has a ICAC, the Independent Commission Against Corruption, which publishes reports and it did an investigation into a planner who worked for the council who engaged in uh, close personal relationships with a number of developers that she also worked on their applications and yeah, basically this report uh, into the investigation into corruption affecting Wollongong City Council focused on her and how she developed these relationships. And uh, it seemed uh, in, the, in the report, the conclusion for why she did it uh, was that she um, was planning to develop her own private consultancy after she left council. And she wanted these developers as her clients. So while she, but while she was working for council, she was in close personal relations with the developers and basically waving through their uh, development applications. So basically, um, yeah, a complete conflict of interest um, and yeah, tantamount to corruption in her role as a um, employee for Wollongong City Council. So in this report, it basically looked at the applications that she had assessed and found that the 
decisions were unlawful, that that she had not followed a number of um, requirements, and that no reasonable person um, could have basically no reasonable planner in her position could have basically taken the approach that she took, and so it was a damning report. Uh, so that's an example of real life corruption within a local government, and. It's from New South Wales. No doubt we've got plenty of corruption in local government in Queensland. It's just that we don't have such good uh, public published reports about them. Uh, and so it's difficult to, to um, speak about them, and particularly in a specific um, factual scenario. So a couple of duties that I just wanted to flag for you arising out of this uh, corruption and, and this sort of case involving her. So the first is a really important duty of a duty to disclose and avoid conflicts of interest. So a conflict of interest is generally of most relevance to elected representatives and government employees who are required to make decisions on matters that they may have a personal interest in. A conflict of interest involves a conflict between a person's personal interests and their duty as an elected representative employee or office bearer um, or their duty to a client and the conflict might arise from a range of factors involving including personal relationships so if you are working for a local government for instance and uh, you're assessing applications and then on your desk arrives an application from uh, say your brother or sister who is making an application well you've clearly got a conflict of interest in assessing that application so that's a personal um, relationship that creates a conflict of interest. Um, but also there could be employment or clients or membership of a special interest group or owning property involved in the application. So there's a whole range of reasons why you're not just a disinterested um, person in assessing an application. Now, having a conflict of interest is quite common um, or not unusual to use the double negative. So having conflicts of interest is common. They crop up all of the time. In real life, you know, you're working in an area, you've got friends and family in that area, uh, you'll come across situations involving your friends and family or, or others that, you know, that affect you personally. So you have a conflict of interest. So you should basically have a little flag that comes up in your head and identifies, hey, I've got a conflict of interest here. This isn't something where I'm just dealing with it independently. So having a conflict of interest isn't a wrongdoing in itself. I want to emphasize that. Just because you've got a conflict of interest doesn't mean you've done anything wrong at that point. But what where you can get into problems is, is if you fail to disclose it and manage the conflict appropriately. And that can be where the wrongdoing occurs. So let's just say, go back to that example where you're working for a local government and you get an application that um, you realize straight away it's come from your brother or your sister or a company that they own. So you identify you've got a conflict of interest. What you should do is alert your manager. Any organization, like say you're working for Brisbane City Council or you know another local government, they'll give you training in conflicts of interest. But the basic way that it works is if you've got a conflict of interest, you should alert your manager that you've got this conflict. And what typically will occur in a large organization is they'll say, no problem, we'll give that file to someone else and you don't you're not involved in assessing the application. So that means you've managed the conflict appropriately and there's no wrongdoing. It would be a wrongdoing if you went on and assessed it. Um, but if you manage it appropriately, it's not a problem. In small organizations, say you work for a small council where there's only a few people working in the development assessment team and there's no one else that can assess it. Well, in that sort of situation, what you need to do is be really careful and document that you've disclosed the conflict of interest, make that really clear to people in terms of the assessment. If there's no option but for you to go ahead and do it, then you should be very careful. It would be my advice to you and document it um, because it can come back and bite you really badly. So yeah, the basic duty of an elected representative and government employee is to disclose a conflict of interest and typically not participate in decision-making concerning matters in which they have a conflict of interest. In private practice, a conflict of interest should typically be disclosed to your employer or client for them to resolve as they wish. 
So if you were, say, working as a town planner and a client comes in who wants to do a big shopping center right next to your house, you should tell them that you live right next to it um, because you've got a conflict of interest. It's, it's not as significant if you're in, your, if you're in private practice, um, but you should still disclose it. And what I would do if I was the developer would be to ask you, well, are you in favor of the proposal or not? Because a conflict of interest can actually be something that's good for a client, you know, because they realize that you know something about their site. It's more than just a file to you. Like, you know, as a client, I, I would actually be quite happy if the town planner who was working on my application lived right next door and was really supportive of it. You know, because you know that you've got someone who's on your side and they actually know the location really well, so they should actually be able to do a better job, even though they've got a conflict of interest. So having a conflict of interest isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's how you deal with it that's the uh, important thing. So, and they come in many different shapes and forms. So uh, it's an important issue to be aware of, but there's no, there's, there's many different ways that conflict of interest can arise. So being paid to do work in, inherently involves a conflict of interest to produce the result that the client wants, um, but that's not generally acknowledged publicly. So you know, if you're being paid, um, in, to an extent you have a conflict of interest already because you, know, you can see that you want more work from the client. There's, there's a conflict there, but you generally don't acknowledge that. Another aspect related to the Wollongong example and one that also is important for your professional practice, and I say this even though corruption is relatively, in comparison to many countries of the world, Australia is relatively, has relatively low levels of corruption. We still have corruption, but it's uh, not as extensive as in many countries. Uh, but I, I want to really emphasize the duty not to engage in official corruption and bribery to you because it is uh, an important issue that particularly if you work overseas you really need to be careful about. So a number of laws create criminal offences for official corruption and bribery of public officials. In Queensland that includes section 87 of the criminal code and there's this big long complicated definition of what corruption is and I'll just read it to you but there's a lot of words the reason why there's a lot of words is because they're creating a criminal offense and corruption can come in many forms and what they want to do what they're trying to do in writing it in this complicated way is to really cover a whole range of different ways that people might carry out corruption because yeah people that are engaged in corrupt conduct can be really uh, tricky and deceitful and try and cover their tracks. So these offences um, look, sound complicated because they're trying to cover all situations where people are engaging in um, you know, covering their tracks. So official corruption, any person who being employed in the public service or being a, the holder of any public office and being charged with the performance of any duty by virtue, virtue of such employment or office. So you work for government, if you corruptly ask for, receive, obtain, or agree, or attempt to receive or obtain any property or benefit of any kind for yourself uh, or any other person on account of anything done or omitted to be done or otherwise done or uh, um, omitted to be done by the person in the discharge of the duties or the person's office. So that's covering situations like you're assessing an application and you, you know, you might indicate that your son needs a job, you know, is that they're looking for work and um, are there any jobs at this, you know, you're assessing an application for a company and you ask in, in the performance of your duties and, it, and it's, and it's you, you do it in a way that it's like you're fishing for a, a job for your son uh, to basically give them a favorable answer. Well, that clearly starts to raise red flags uh, that that's corrupt conduct because even though it's a benefit not directly for yourself it's for your son um, it's clearly going to come within a, a, the, a normal definition of corruption like that it doesn't have to be a benefit directly to you 
And similarly, um, the B in that is if someone uh, outside government um, corruptly gives, confers or procures or promises or offers to give or confer uh, on a person in public service, a benefit um, for doing something or not doing something. So if you're about to be charged for an offence and you offer to pay money uh, to not be charged, then that's clearly corrupt conduct. Typically, though, corruption can occur in... It's, it's not as obvious as, um, as someone offering money in that really coarse way. Uh, it can be subtle. Typically, uh, in my experience, it's people do it with plausible deniability. So uh, let's just say a developer is um, applying for a big development and there's a council officer who is um, causing problems and the developer's in a meeting with that officer and uh, let's just say you're in that meeting with the developer and you're a town planner and you're in the meeting and the developer says to, and there's only three of you in the room and this uh, council officer is being really problematic and the developer then says, well, we're so impressed with you know the work you're doing um, on this, this file, this application. You know, we're always looking for good um, staff and you know I, I think you're only earning a hundred thousand here a year you know if you come and work for us you know we could easily be paying you two hundred thousand dollars a year because we're always looking for good staff now the way that that is approached there's plausible deniability because the developer could you know if the if the um, government officer said what are you trying to bribe me the developer immediately says no 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 we're always just looking for good staff oh heaven forbid you know we're not we're not doing there's no bribe here we're just looking for good staff why could you think such a terrible thing so plausible deniability is often used to basically camouflage um, corrupt conduct so if I boil that down to two statements that are on your handout, as a public servant, including as a local government employee, it's a crime for you to corruptly ask for or receive any money, property or other benefit for the performance of your public duties. As a consultant, it's a crime for you to corruptly offer to give money, property or another benefit to an elected official or public servant or be party to such an act. So if you're sitting in the room with your client who has made this offer to a government employee, then you should have red flags coming up in your mind immediately because if you're aiding them, you can also be charged with the corrupt conduct. And yeah, be really careful with it. So corruption exists in Australia, as that example from Wollongong readily demonstrates, and you'll face it in your career, uh, if particularly if it involves international work. So corruption is a global scourge and it erodes good governance in many countries and I'll just put up there's a couple of um, slides there about corruption at an international level but I really just wanted to um, show you this map I think I showed it back in lecture one of uh, corruption across the world as viewed by multinational corporations working uh, in you know, many countries around the world the darker red countries were the countries perceived to be the worst for corruption. So through Southeast Asia, Africa, um, China, also significant corruption issues, uh, uh, Russia, uh, South America, Central America. Now, that's again, I want to emphasize we have corruption in Australia and there's corruption in the US and Canada and, and Europe. So everywhere has corruption problems, but uh, some countries are a lot worse than others. I just noticed we've been going for an hour. Uh, let's take a break, hey, for uh, 10 minutes and come back and we will, uh, I'll play a little video uh, after the break of uh, a very courageous uh, woman, Simone Marsh, speaking to ABC Four Corners and we'll talk about duty of confidentiality and yeah, resolving conflicting professional duties. So let's take a 10 minute break. Welcome back to the second half of our lecture. So the third problem that I want to look at is of a former Queensland government employee, Simone Marsh, speaking to the ABC Four Corners program in 2013. And I want to use this to 
talk about duties of confidentiality and resolving conflicting professional duties and ethical dilemmas. So this is actually an example of a whistleblower breaching the duty of confidentiality and speaking out publicly to protect the community. So I'm going to play you the first 30 seconds and then uh, about seven minutes from 15 minutes to 22 minutes in the this program. So this aired in 2013 when there's a series of uh, large uh, calcium gas developments had been approved in Queensland and there'd been these mega projects that had come through and Simone Marsh was one of the employees who had uh, assessed the applications and she was speaking out about the poor assessments that were undertaken and the pressure put on her to not address issues like groundwater. Rivers alive with methane. Never seen it before. Water you can set fire to. The industry says it's all perfectly safe. The last thing I want to be associated with is an industry that's going to be toxic or poison. It's just not that. But others disagree. I think the truth is that it's not an ecologically sustainable activity. Behind the scenes in the great coal seam gas debate. Welcome to Four Corners. I'm going to drag forward to 15 minutes because the program then went to look at a lot of different farms before coming back to Simone Marsh at about 15 minutes. So I'll play the next um, five minutes. Baseline studies have been done on the water table. So, Welcome back. We've got nothing to hide. All of this raises some basic but fundamental questions about whether proper baseline studies have been done on the water table and environmental impacts. Which leads to another important question. Why has the coal seam gas industry been allowed to proceed at such a rapid pace? Tonight, Four Corners can reveal why. Simone Marsh played a critical role in the approval process of Australia's largest coal seam gas developments, Santos's $18 billion project and QGC's $20 billion project in southern Queensland. She was a key insider and she's telling her story for the first time. I think the truth is that it's not an ecologically sustainable activity. Obviously they didn't want to say that. They wanted approval to come in and conduct that activity. They didn't want anyone to understand what the long-term um, impacts were going to be and the long-term costs associated with this activity. Four Corners asked Santos and QGC for an on-camera interview, but they declined. Rick Wilkinson is the industry spokesperson. I think it's right and proper that there should be whistleblowers and if something is not right, then they should raise it. But I'm confident from what I've seen that the right processes were followed. And there were many checks and balances on the way through. Simone Marsh's job for the first half of 2010 in the Queensland Department of Infrastructure and Planning was to assess the environmental impact of these massive billion-dollar Santos and QGC developments. They were deemed state-significant projects to be overseen by Queensland's Coordinator General. It was an impossible task. Firstly, the information wasn't there, so you can't do an assessment without the basic site information, the, the baseline studies, um, and an understanding of where the infrastructure was going to be laid, laid out and uh, which um, environmental, environmentally sensitive areas were going to be impacted. This is a remarkable claim, but it's backed up by 900 pages of documents obtained by Four Corners through the Right to Information legislation in Queensland. The documents detail an approval process that was rushed, made with insufficient information and put commercial considerations above environmental ones. Simone Marsh's first task was to assess the Santos project. She was surprised to find only a concept with little hard data on where the wells or pipelines were going or potential environmental impacts. 
it was quite frightening that they would consider approving such a project without the basic information that a normal mining project would have been asked to submit, given that this was like 600 times the size of your standard um, large mine. Um, and for a large mine, you would normally have the boundaries um, clearly articulated. Um, you would have done all the baseline studies beforehand. In particular, Simone was shocked that no assessment was going to be done on the impacts to groundwater for the Santos project. I was taken into a meeting room, sat down and told that there wasn't going to be a chapter on groundwater. And I was stunned. I, I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean there's not going to be a chapter on groundwater? It's one of the biggest issues for the project. And he just repeated the words that there was not going to be a groundwater chapter in the Santos Coordinator General's report and wouldn't give me any reason why or why not. But a document from the 4th of May 2010 offers some explanation. It's a brief sent by the Department of Planning and Infrastructure to the Coordinator General. It states... As advised previously, not all the usual information is available. And goes on. This has been difficult and uncertain without the full suite of information normally available. We are mindful of the Coordinator General's report being able to provide a bankable outcome. They're after a bankable outcome, <laughs> which is not anything to do with an environmental impact assessment process. Um, they basically just want an approval. That's all they want is an approval with some conditions that the companies can live with. When Simone Marsh learnt the time frames for the Santos assessments were going to be cut short, she decided to act and wrote this email to her superiors listing 26 concerns. I wrote that email to make sure that the deputies, coordinator generals, the assistant coordinator generals and the project directors were aware that the information I had been preparing and that I had been drafting and sending through to the project directors was not making it into the final report and that key information that and um, conclusions that I had drawn from the material that I could access was being altered or ignored um, and that the proponents themselves were having a large role in dictating the information that went into the report and, and into the conditions as, as well. Three days before the Santos report was due, Simone made one last attempt with this document to warn about the potential damage to the water table. The next day, there was this response. I have significant concerns with the words proposed by Simone. On the 28th of May, the Coordinator General at the time, Colin Jensen, delivered his report on the Santos project. There was no groundwater assessment, only half a page dealing with policy and legislation. But surprisingly, the Coordinator General said he was not convinced there was sufficient detail to determine impacts on environmental values. After reviewing Santos's environmental impact statement and its supplementary, the Coordinator General called on Santos to provide 10 key reports, including comprehensive water management plans for the next phase of approval. Rick Wilkinson was head of the Santos LNG... Col Just going to leave that and go back so you can watch that whole program uh, on the link that's in the slides. But I just want to unpack, or want to use that to just talk about what's occurred here in, in, in relation to our professional duties, not so much uh, the focus on how badly the EIS was done, but on what Simone was doing. And just to start with, why do you think, she, one of the things she said was she was taken into a meeting room and told there was going to be no groundwater chapter. Why do you think her, the manager in that case took her into a meeting room and talked with her about it? Why do you think it was just a conversation? Do you want to take yourself off mute?
there's no written um, like you it doesn't have a written uh, like traceability to it. I can, that's exactly it. There's no written record then because uh, governments have had for a few decades, one of the things that has been built into the system to promote integrity is an ability for members of the public to request documents on particular topics called freedom, freedom of information searches. So the simple way you get around that in the public service is don't create a document. If you're going to do something dodgy, don't record it in an email. Uh, have a telephone conversation or uh, a just face-to-face -face conversation and then there's no written record. And then you effectively escape any risk of an FOI um, request revealing the dodgy dealing down the track. What do you think um, when Simone sent that email, the detailed email voicing her concerns, how do you think her managers would have reacted to that email. What would have been the immediate thought that would go through like a manager's mind when you saw that email in terms of FOI? Uh, this has to be, yeah, this has to be traced now because it's like this document exists now. Well, yeah, it's, I think you're actually probably being too kind. There would have been probably a few swear words that went through the mind of at least several of the recipients because you actually sent it to a whole heap of people within the coordinator general's office and they would have known immediately that this was a real problem that they had a key person that was assessing it that had actually committed her con concerns to writing so she wasn't just talking with them about it in a non-documentary way but she'd set it all out in an in an email that then could be foi'd so that creates a significant problem if you're Basically, if your objective is just to get this thing approved and avoid embarrassment to the government, then having a document like that lying around uh, or in your system is a real landmine that can go off in the future. What do you think when Simone, okay, Simone had been in the public service then for like 20 years, she'd been working for the Department of Environment before being sent across to the Coordinator General's office to help with these big assessments. Do you think she would have known uh, about the implications of sending the email when she sent it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what do you think she's doing to her career in sending that email? It's uh, keeping it reputable. Yeah, sabotage is a good word, but you know, like, it's like, yeah, really brave um, would be the word I would use. Uh, and just for a bit of context around that time there had been uh, strong criticism of the, those big projects and how their approval processes were rushed and uh, this is, these are some of the news reports from early 2013 basically saying pressure felt to rush CSG approvals this is from um, the uh, Queensland newspaper I won't mention its name um, there in the screen um, so bureaucrats leaned on by Bly heavies Public servants at the two departments tasked in giving the official go-ahead to Queensland's new coal seam gas industry were blindsided by the Bly government's demands that two of the gigantic projects be approved within weeks of each other. Documents obtained by an investigation revealed that the $18 billion Santos GLNG project was nearing its approval in May 2010. And at that time, public servants were hit with demands from the government to also tackle the $16 billion QGC project and then the origin-led APLNG proposal approved in November of the same year. And just days before the QGC approval was granted, public servants were warning that the directors of the government's assessment team that they had still not been given any detailed information on the pipelines and the location of the wells. They also warned a, they also warned a long list of environmental issues had not been fully analysed. So this is separate to Simone's uh, concerns and complaint. So this is another report about the, the way that those applications were rushed. And this was an internal email from the 11th of February 2013 from the Director of EIS Assessments in what's now the Department of Environment and Science, Stuart Cameron, uh, in response to a request for draft conditions to be submitted in three days. And he wrote, I have consistently been advised by the Department of Infrastructure and Planning that QGC was down the track and the DIP had not even started writing their report. 
we have had no warning for this sudden request for immediate provision of QGC conditions or any notice of a meeting tomorrow. In addition, we have the APLNG comment on their EIS due tomorrow, for which we were given less than four weeks to deal with 10,000 pages. Once again, I am faced with a physically impossible request along with the other 80 EIS processes that are projects that are starting to slip. So that points to you know, the huge pressures that staff were under to approve these things. Then uh, this is a report from 2016, again involving um, Simone. So she basically went public and then continued to try and um, raise concerns about the environmental impacts around coal seam gas in particular. So this was a report of um, an investigation in 2016 into uh, the projects on Curtis Island. So in that context, I just want to deal with some of the professional duties. So duty of confidentiality. In addition to requirements for uh, confidentiality imposed by contractual terms, the common law imposes a duty of loyalty and fidelity upon all employees. And this duty arises from the contract of employment. Um, but it may also arise where the employee is in a special position of trust and confidence. And in the context of confidential information, the duty requires that an employee must not use information obtained in the course of their employment to the detriment of the employer. And the basic rule is that you should not disclose documents or information obtained through the course of your employment that are not publicly available unless authorized by your client or employer, um, e.g. by providing a commercial and confidence um, information to a local government as part of the development application. So you might be authorised by a client to provide something that's confidential as part of a development application. So that's that's then okay. But if you're not authorised, you can't do it. So in Simone Marsh's situation, can you see that she was breaching that duty of confidentiality by talking about things, even though um, the... Four Corners had a range of documents that they'd gotten through freedom of information requests, including documents that she had written. She was talking about things like the meeting she had and that she'd been told there'd be no groundwater chapter. So she's talking about things that were confidential and it was detrimental to her employer, the Queensland government, because basically it's pointing to bad decision making. So she breached her duty of confidentiality. In, if you're working uh, for government, there's a range of similar duties not to disclose information that's not publicly available. At least in theory, there's a Public Interest Disclosure Act that protects public interest disclosures by Queensland public servants, including matters involving the commission of an offence involving a substantial and specific danger to the environment. But Public Interest Disclosure Act doesn't authorise you to go to the press it authorises you to do things like um, alert, say, the top uh, manager or you know, the, the director general of your department or possibly your minister uh, or some other, um, yeah, some other um, senior government decision maker. But it doesn't authorise you to go to the press. Um, there used to be a Whistleblowers Disclosure Act that... Uh, authorised a similar sort of um, disclosures. But in theory, a public servant who makes a public interest disclosure under the Public um, Interest Disclosure Act is protected. But in practice, speaking out publicly against your employer is unlikely to be good for your career. So um, let alone what Simone did with going to the, um, yeah, the media... I know when I worked for the Department of Environment up in Townsville in uh, 2000, oh, sorry, 1998 and 1999, I ended up being really concerned about lack of enforcement up there. And I wrote a um, disclosure under the Whistleblowers Protection Act, at, which was the law in force at the time, to my minister. Um, and basically, I just took a copy of the file and... Um, put a cover letter on it, but I, it was my, I basically put it in the post. I remember um, on the last day I was working for the department, 
I put the this big envelope with a lot of documents in it in the post uh, to go down to the minister so it would arrive a few days after I had left because if you're a public servant, you're making one of these disclosures, sure the Act talks about protecting you but you are torching your career. Um, so Simone Marsh, you can see that she'd be torching her career with you know, speaking out about these things because that's going beyond the whistleblower's protection. And this is a quote from a, a book or from a person who wrote a book on a step-to-step guide to protecting yourself in the whistleblower's handbook. And um, this author, author had written, whistleblowers know that anonymity is their best shield against the tyranny of government. Once a whistleblower is known, his or her life is never the same. They're ostracized, fired and blacklisted. So, yeah, it's yeah, a tough um, situation. If you're a public servant and you see something wrong going on, what do you do about it? Uh, it's, can, it's, it's, not, it's often not a black and white um, question to or answer that you get to that question. So hearing a public servant speak out publicly against a government decision is very unusual and very courageous. Someone like Simone was torching her career. She could, you know, would never be able to go back to government after speaking to Four Corners. Why would she do it then? Why would she just torture her career? Well, you know, sometimes there'll be people that have got an axe to grind or something like that. Everything that I've seen about Simone Marsh points to the opposite. It points to her being just a really honest person who was really ethical, who was also really concerned for the community and the risks that were being uh, glossed over in approval of these massive projects. So she was driven essentially by her own ethics to make these disclosures and yeah, pretty well destroy her career in the public service. So Simone is really courageous. She's also really unusual. Most public servants observe a code of silence or at most leak damaging documents anonymously to the press. Uh, and now, if you become a public servant, um, you're going to be very aware of the politics surrounding issues. So if you work for government, politics will have a heavy impact on your career. If you're, for example, if you're employed by the Queensland government assessing coal mines or coal seam gas, you simply won't be able to recommend it be refused based on matters such as climate change. Um, you, you won't be in, like if you're working for the Department of Environment and Science and you were to recommend a coal mine not be approved because of climate change impacts, you wouldn't be working in that section for long. You mightn't be fired outright, but you wouldn't be you know, you're not going to be promoted. You're not going to work in that section. You're going to be moved around. You're not going to, you can't voice those sorts of opinions, even though it may well be the conclusion you'd come to from, you know, your studies uh, that, you know, that these minds are crazy. We shouldn't be doing this. We, we need to do, we need to shut down our um, fossil fuel sector to save things like the Great Barrier Reef. But if you were to make that recommendation working for the state or federal governments now, there's no way that that recommendation is going to be followed uh, and you won't be working in that section for very long. So yeah, Simone Marsh, why do you think she took those steps? Well, um, my view is it's because of her own ethics. Someone said to me really early in my career, don't stand in the way of speeding trains. And I didn't understood what he meant when he said it, but I came to understand there's a lot of big projects that have a lot of political support and you can't stand in their way or you, you'll just be squashed. And in this context, uh, I gave this lecture a few years ago and one of the postgrad students who had over 20 years professional experience uh, wrote to me after the lecture and he gave me permission to use uh, his part of his comments, including this. So he made the point that you need to look after your mental well-being if you're in this situation because when dealing with ethical and professional responsibilities issues, a key consideration is taking stock of your own mental state when you're deciding how to respond. And from his experience, basically, if you're in a poor mental state, then you're in a much poorer position in terms of your ability to effectively respond. Uh, and being involved in resolving ethical issues can often take an onerous toll on the people as they're often political and highly complex to deal with. So the question for me uh, is, do I have the capacity, that is, 
good enough mental state to engage in a particular ethical issue. And if I do not have the capacity, then I shouldn't engage in the problem. Alternatively, if the issue is that important to me, then I need to come up with an appropriate strategy, but a strategy where I put myself in the middle of resolving the ethic, but a strategy where I put myself in the middle of resolving the ethical issues isn't a good idea. Unfortunately, things often don't fit into a nice clear-cut scenario. But I think the important aspect is that professionals need to be very aware of their personal mental state and take ownership of it. And I think the ownership aspect is particularly important as problems like depression and anxiety are various and complex. And from what I can gather, very rarely associated just with work. So you can have a lot of different pressures. And I suspect that problems arise for people in professional life when they are not just subjected to the occasional big challenges um, as noted in this lecture, but are subject to the, a big challenge after big challenge as this causes pressure to accumulate to a point where a person reaches breaking point. So I thought that those were really valuable uh, insights from that student and as I said, he gave me permission to share that with you. So these are complex and hard issues to deal with. I just wanted to um, finish dealing with common uh, ethical and legal issues for the workplace by looking at a couple of other um, topics that I just wanted. I just I don't know if you deal with it anywhere else in your course, and I really thought that they were so important. I wanted to deal with them. So, duty to, duty to avoid discrimination, duty to maintain a safe workplace, uh, including avoiding workplace harassment and bullying, and duty to avoid surrect, uh, sorry sexual harassment. So I've dealt with these on your a handout so you can go to those um, number seven number eight uh, so duty to avoid discrimination uh, includes um, sex discrimination um, there's a, a duty as well to maintain a safe workplace and I know in this course we've got a number of students who are doing occupational health and safety uh, for their studies so you have there's a, a, a vitally important duty for any employee on a workplace to essentially engage in safe work pra practices. Um, big sites like mines and uh, other big projects, you know, if you go onto the site, you will have um, safety inductions um, before you can really do anything. There's a huge emphasis on it and it's, it's a vital aspect of um, our whole workplace now is, is safety. So, those issues um, I've dealt with in the handout. I don't um, need to unpack them. They, they are things that you will deal with in, uh, yeah, in the work workforce. I wanted to give you though a, a terrible example of you know, how workplace health and safety can, uh, for environment uh, officers, can be. Uh, can involve uh, situations that can lead to death of regulators. So this is a terrible uh, case of a murder that occurred in 2014 of an environmental officer. Uh, and these are some pictures of where essentially a farmer um, shot this um, environmental officer uh, and killed him. Uh, this is the location, so you can see the ambulance there uh, and, and the other vehicles. This was the crime scene. Uh, this is the... I find this really hard, this case. Uh, Glenn Turner was his name. And this is his family. This is a really hard topic. Yeah. He was shot here. This is some of the crime scene. I'm sorry, I don't think I can. Um, he um, he'd been. He'd gone to the property to look at illegal land clearing. And these were some of the pictures that were taken before he was killed. 
the farmer um, was told that he was there by another employee and the farmer took his gun, went in search of the two It's okay, we can just read it if you want yeah. to just take a minute. Um, that's the farmer. <laughs> you can just read that slide. So I, sorry, I couldn't deal with that. Um, it's okay. Okay, just moving on to the final um, duty, uh, duty to avoid sexual harassment, and also your right not to be subject to se sexual harassment. Um, so this is prohibited under the Anti-Discrimination Act, and if it occurs in the workplace, then it's also a workplace health, work health and safety issue. Now, um, essentially, in, in my experience, um, often sexual harassment occurs again with plausible de deniability, and, and often it can be really uncomfortable to deal with. So, in at least in my experience, it's not uh, an obvious, you know, walking up and and doing something that uh, often it will be. Uh, either snide comments or uh, something that again gives plausible deniability and often it's really hard to deal with and uh, these are some of the examples that are given um, on the uh, anti-discrimination website things like physical contact contact such as patting pinching touching in a sexual way unnecessary familiarity um, propositions, unwelcome and uncalled for remarks and insinuations, um, suggestive, suggestive comments about a person's appearance or body. Uh, so yeah, as I, as I said, in my experience, sexual harassment can be very difficult and embarrassing to deal with in the workplace because, you know, let's just say you're in a, a group of people where there might be a team of 10 and um, you observe or it, it occurs to you that someone becomes keen on another person in the workplace but that isn't reciprocated it can become really difficult to deal with uh, and embarrassing I remember being in a situation where uh, I was a manager in a, uh, a law office and one of the other lawyers was harassing one of the secretaries who came to me and spoke to me about it but she asked for me not to raise it with him because she wanted to deal with it but she was raising it with me and I agreed not to take any action on it um, because she asked me to do, you know not to do that and I always regretted afterwards that I didn't uh, and uh, it's often not black and white how you deal with it and I, I uh, come to the I suppose the view that you shouldn't accept unacceptable behavior whether it's directed at you or a colleague at work so if you see it occurring to someone else they're being harassed or bullied then uh, you should take action uh, and don't accept unacceptable behavior. But as, as I said, there's often no black and white. Okay. The um, other, so those, those are duties imposed by law, but I just wanted to mention a couple of other aspects of um, professional duties that are related. So often there's industry codes of practice. So if you're a planner, you might join the Planning Institute of Australia. In fact, if you're a planner, I recommend that you join the Planning Institute of Australia. If you're not yet a member, then join it as a student. And uh, there's other, you know, that I'll come to uh, engineers and env other environmental professionals. So there's a range of professional bodies and they typically have codes of conduct. So PIA has a code of conduct, which I've just got, you can get it off their website, but here's not very long, but the, the contents deal with um, competency, due diligence, uh, due care and due diligence, respect, honesty and integrity, professional behaviour, confidentiality and disclosure. Uh, and I've just extracted a bit there. So you see um, number four in their code of conduct. Our members will keep all information provided to them during the course of their work confidential. 
uh, and shall not disclose or use uh, any of that information for their own benefit or disclose it to any um, third party unless the information is authorized to be publicly available or is required by law to be disclosed uh, or with the express written approval of the legal owner of that information. So that reflects the law uh, and the principles that I just talked about, but this is in a code of conduct. So if you're a member of that association, you're, you know, you've got this legal duty and it's also reflected in the code of conduct. Similarly, um, the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand, which is a, uh, a professional association for environmental professionals generally, they have a code of conduct which has similar sorts of things, um, promote environmental pr um, principles, demonstrate integrity, um, practice competently. So things like due diligence and the like all get um, wrapped up into those codes of conduct. Uh, EIANZ has a certified environmental practitioner program where the, basically they uh, look to certify you and give you, you know, training and then um, it's a, an important part of their membership. So another example that I just refer to is the Engineers Australia Code of Ethics, which I think is one of the best written. It's really straightforward and I really like it. They say that in the course of engineering practice, we will demonstrate integrity practice competently, exercise leadership and promote sustainability. And yeah, I just think it's a really good code of ethics. If you work for the public service, there's also legal obligations under the Public Sector Ethics Act, which uh, set up four ethical principles for integrity and impartiality, promoting good, uh, the public good, commitment to the system of government and accountability and transparency. And they have a code of conduct um, built around those uh, principles. I don't need to go there because I just wanted to summarize a few things. A lot of the sort of things that are dealt with in that code of conduct are, are things that I've already talked about. So manage conflicts of interest. A conf conflict of interest involves a conflict between our duty as a public service employee to serve the public interest and our private, sorry, personal interests. The conflict may arise from a range of factors, including our personal relationships, our employment outside the public service, our membership of special groups, or our ownership of shares, companies, or property. So again, that's just reflecting what I've already covered. And also this, in that public service code of conduct, uh, ensure appropriate use of official resources, public pro property and facilities, and yeah, basically not to waste um, public uh, resources and another one ensure appropriate use and disclosure of official information so again this is about confidentiality and yeah there's no easy answer to a lot of questions about ethics you know what should you do as a public servant if you see bad decisions being made well it really depends on the circumstances and a, a whole range of factors uh, if it's something that is relatively low level that you think, well, you know, this is a bad decision that's been made. You've, you've advised your manager, say, to make, to do something and they don't want to do it and you think that's a bad decision. Well, if it's just part of the normal conduct where you just think, well, they're not very competent, you know, that's just life. Sometimes you just live with it and, and move on. In other circumstances like this with Simone Marsh, she obviously realized, you know, her, it's obvious that this was much more than just a small scale minor error that was being made. She saw something really bad happening that was being glossed over. Big decisions were being made about huge projects that she was a key person involved in. And uh, she came forward about it. Again, my view, having looked at um, all the material um, and what she did and the context is she wasn't someone that was mentally unstable or, you know, there can be those reasons why someone is, you know, if someone's saying there's this huge problem that isn't being dealt with, you know, you, you've got to think, well, um, are they, you know, are they all there? Is it, is there some reason why they might be disgruntled? They might just be angry about something that's, you know, that this isn't true. Everything I've looked at with Simone Marsh says the opposite, that she was um, a very smart person who struggled deeply with what to do and then came forward uh, having basically decided that she couldn't do anything else. Um, I've got four fact scenarios to deal 
that I just wanted to discuss with you, but we're almost out of time. So can I come back to them? We'll deal with them uh, either after the uh, this lecture or if anyone's got time or uh, in the tutorials as well. Um, so I'm conscious that we're getting close to or we really should be wrapping up this lecture now. So just to add another comment from a past student that what to do if you're put in an ethically difficult position by your superior. Um, if you're asked to write a report in a favorable light for your client, which you know isn't right. And this student wrote that from my personal experience, the first time you face an ethically questionable situation is going to be one that your boss puts you in rather than clients. And yeah, it makes it really hard. Should you speak up or should you basically just do what you're told? Again, there's no simple answer to that question. Um, I used to say with a friend of mine when I started work as a barrister, we used to talk a lot about ethics and we had this little catch phrase that we would use. We would talk about long term, short term. And what we meant by that was unethical acts might give you a short term gain. Um, but if you adopt such practices, you can expect negative impacts on your career over the long term as you become known for unethical or shady behavior as well as lowering your own sense of pride and feelings of being a good person. So, you know, short term benefit, but long term cost, as opposed to doing things for the long term for your career. And yeah, you have to ask yourself in your career, what do you want to achieve? And my view is that community benefit and public service and pride in what you do should be an important part of your career. It's not just about making a lot of money. So professional duties and ethics uh, need not be seen as a negative risk in your career. They can also be seen as positive goals within your own values and a vision for what you want to achieve. The best professionals and workplaces aim to translate these professional duties into creating an effective, ethical and supportive work environment that people want to be part of and contribute to. And Professor Stuart Finn, uh, who is uh, a senior academic with School of Earth Environmental Sciences, you might have um, been fortunate to have him in other courses. He pointed out this out to me when I asked staff several years ago about whether any other ethical issues that I should be raising in this lecture. And he gave me this example from his um, research group, the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network, where they had created this one page statement of what they wanted to do in terms of creating an ethical and supportive work environment. So they talked about uh, for their team that they would be reliable and trustworthy, uh, they would be diverse, they would have a shared purpose, they would support each other, they would be positive and innovative, they would have effective communication and they would be accountable. So they were seeing this in a positive way. So if you are doing that and seeing it in a positive way, then it's a nice, much nicer way than, you know, just thinking, oh, I need to show due diligence because otherwise someone will sue me. Well, if you are setting yourself high standards and saying, I'm going to be really good at what I do, I'm going to check everything, I'm going to get this right, then you're making a positive affirmation that in itself achieves compliance with your legal duties. I'm conscious that it's 10.55. I've still got another five or 10 minutes to go on the lecture. Apologies that I'm going to go slightly over with this lecture, but I'll just wrap up um, briefly. If you need to go to go to another lecture, my apologies. Uh, for not finishing on time. So to summarize ethics and professional goals, um, I'd say this, be honest, be independent, don't be a hired gun, strive to find the right answer to professional problems and be a good team member, um, friends with your work colleagues, respect others and value their contributions, serve the public interest in the community. Like if, if those are your ethics and what you're trying to do, then most of the other things will take care of themselves. I just wanted to deal with finally in this lecture a really brief overview of courts and ethics as expert witnesses. So in our lecture we've talked about courts a fair bit and one of the courts that is particularly important for environmental professionals or planners in particular in Queensland is the Planning and Environment Court where a lot of appeals are heard. So if there is a development application that's refused, the developer 
can appeal it or they're unhappy with conditions that are imposed, they can appeal to the Planning and Environment Court. And there's about 600 cases um, that are brought in the p and &E Court every year. Uh, and I've used several examples of them in earlier lectures. So that's a particularly important court for environmental issues in Queensland. The Land Court of Queensland deals with mining issues. So uh, again, I've talked about that in the context of the mining lecture and things like the Ackland Mine. So again, an important court to d in Queensland. Um, most of the other courts, like the Magistrates Court and the District Court, deal with prosecutions of environmental offences. Uh, appeals go to the Queensland Court of Appeal and there's also ultimately the High Court of Australia is the ultimate appellate court but very few environmental cases get up to the High Court. In a couple of weeks time I've got a special leave application involving the Ackland mine going to the High Court. I would have, if, it, if we'd been in normal times, I would have invited you to come along and listen in but because of the coronavirus restrictions there's very limited access for the public at the moment so I I'm sorry I can't invite you along to that. But the High Court matters are very rare. The bread and butter sort of work involving the courts occurs in the Planning and Environment Court in particular in Queensland. So here's just where the courts are in Brisbane. So this is the Supreme and District Court and also where the Planning and Environment Court is. This is on George Street in Brisbane. The Magistrates Court and the Land Court are in this building uh, as well on uh, Roma and Turbot Streets. Um, so here's, you might have walked down George Street and looked up at this building. So that's the Magistrates Court and also where the Land Court is located. And the Federal Court is just a block away from them. Um, you probably won't be that familiar with it from walking past it because it fronts out onto the freeway. But that's the Federal Court building on North Quay. And here's the front steps of it. So that's where the High Court special leave application will be heard in a couple of weeks. We'll be on video link to Sydney for that. The High Court is located in Canberra. That's the building, beautiful big building. If you're ever in Canberra, go along and have a visit. Here's a typical courtroom. You'll have a judge or a member, depending on what, the, what court or tribunal you're in. And um, they sit up and look back. Um, the barristers or lawyers sit at a table called the bar table and yeah, there's witness boxes and the like. So that's a typical courtroom. Um, here's one of the Supreme Court courtrooms where there's a lot of um, computers and a lot of courts now deal, uh, uh, are um, performed on an electronic basis so that uh, yeah, lots of computers involved. Uh, this is what barristers wear to some trials, so wigs and gowns, but mostly lawyers just wear a black suit to court. So wigs and gowns are worn by barristers. Uh, here is uh, barristers appearing before the High Court, so you can see the judges there, but normally it's just one judge in normal trial. Um, just, this um, person here is Justice Kiefel. She was Justice Kiefel at the time. She's now Chief Justice Kiefel. She's the um, Chief Justice of Australia. Uh, and the man who's speaking is actually also a judge now of the High Court called Stephen Gagler. Uh, he was the Solicitor General when, I, when this um, picture was taken. So that's the High Court. In terms of environmental lit litigation for trials, there's a range of different types. So litigation by private individuals to enforce the law, litigation uh, against government administrative decisions, and litigation by governments. Uh, so. Different types of litigation occur. We've, we've had a whole range of examples through this course. So remember this one, which was the prosecution for uh, illegal land clearing up at Caloundra, where the developer was clearing these trees. Uh, this was a prosecution for clearing in a national park that we talked about back when we talked about nature conservation. Um, here's a case study from my website about the Carmichael coal mine and uh, to illustrate uh, typical court processes and the role of expert witnesses. So uh, another example we've used in earlier lectures for a p and &E court trial is the Plums Chambers example where we looked at uh, demolition of that building on the left in that image. And again, you can look at a case study of that on my website if you want to. The procedure for a PNE court appeal um, is typically this. There's an appeal lodged 
and then um, the court sets out the steps leading up to trial, which normally will occur about three months after lodging the appeal. And before the trial occurs, there'll be a meeting of experts where they'll prepare a joint report. And typically the court will also require a without prejudice conference before it goes to trial. And most things settle, about 80% of p &E cases settle before they get to trial. Um, and anyway, in trial, there's evidence and um, submissions by the lawyers and then a judgment by the court, normally within about six months of the appeal being lodged. So if you are working as an expert witness, in the future you could be a witness in these proceedings and an, and an expert witness can give evidence about their opinion. So what you th what based on your expertise as a town planner or an environmental manager, you can talk about the issues that are live in the case. If you're asked to do that, then the sort of questions you ask is, well, what's the nature of an appeal? Um, what's your role? What are your ethical duties in this situation? And how do you balance your business relationship and your ethical obligations? I've given you a handout on that, which goes through um, your duties. You, then you have a duty to the court uh, and it overrides your duty to the client. But I've also dealt with in that handout the ethical dilemma you have of basically, do you give the client what they want? because it's very difficult for anyone to prove that you're lying. If you say, in my opinion, this is a good development, then you can say, well, that's my opinion, whether it's right or wrong. So it's difficult to catch out a lying expert. And yeah, often experts just become hired guns. They just basically give the clients what they want. And I can't tell you how to, you know, what to do in your career but I've given you some ideas for some three basic principles. You should aim to be independent and yeah, act with integrity. And yeah, if you do that, then yeah, you are fundamentally going to be ethical. So uh, I've given you that on a handout. Don't compromise your honesty and independence and the rigor of your professional opinions. If you can do that, then you've got an ethical practice. So to wrap up, dealt with a number of problems, case studies, um, and woven into those um, some professional duties, some key professional duties for your professional practice. I hope you found that useful. Um, weaving them in, what I've tried to do is, is also bring them to life and make them more than just a black and white, you know, in this situation, do X, because it's very rarely that clear. Often there's competing issues uh, and it's difficult. So to wrap up my final slide, the take home points from this lecture are there are a number of important legal duties imposed upon you as, as a practicing professional, including a duty to take reasonable care, to avoid negligence, a duty to disclose and avoid conflicts of interests, a duty not to engage in corruption, and a duty of confidentiality. And the best professionals in workplaces aim to translate their professional duties into creating an effective, ethical and supportive work environment that people want to be part of and contribute to. And you should strive to be ethical in your professional practice. And yeah, professional integrity and ethics should underpin and shape your whole career. You want your career to be about more than just making money and public service should be a core part of it. That's at least my view, and I hope will be your view in your future careers as well. I hope you found this lecture useful. Uh, I'll wrap up at that point, And again, I hope that you found this and will find this really useful for your professional careers. So here's four fact scenarios. How about we just talk through these and get your views on it? So, and these come through in a lot of the sort of short answer questions that you'll see on the exam, these sorts of scenarios. And then I'm asking you about what other professional duties that are relevant. So here's the scenario. You're working in private practice for a town planning, environmental engineering consultancy, whatever your profession is. A large client of the firm has proposed a development that you believe should not be supported, at least without heavy modifications, which will make the proposal far less profitable. The client will be extremely displeased if you do not support the proposal and your firm may lose a lot of lucrative work in the future. What should you do? Anyone got any thoughts on that? 
You should document the reasons why you think it will be, um, it shouldn't be supported. Yeah, thanks, Tarkin. That's, yep, you can document it. Anyone else? Would you then use that um, documentation to uh, refer it to like your sup superiors or, um, you know, like in writing, talk to someone about it? Yep, that's another good idea, Zoe. Document it. Talk with your superiors about it. I suppose one thought that I would have just in thinking about this is, is, is it's often not black and white. And uh, it also depends on how you approach it. So in this sort of case, you can be smart in how you approach it. Like you don't have to insult the client. You could couch your proposals in a way that uh, the client will accept simply because you're... Uh, can I give you an example? Let's just say you're an environmental manager and there's a creek running through the development and the client wants to clear everything and you know build right up to the creek line. You might uh, approach it by saying, look, if we do that, the council is going to fight us on this. They will want to set back from the creek. They want to maintain the connectivity along the creek. So um, if we clear everything, uh, it's going to be a very difficult fight with the council. But if we leave 50 metres of vegetation on either side of it and put like a little walking path through it and maybe a little cycleway, we could make this a component of the development to sell it to potential purchasers and it can actually be a selling point for the development. Council is going to love it if we leave the vegetation along the creek we can incorporate it into it. People you know, will love the wildlife along it. Uh, it actually can be a great selling point. It can value add to our development. Plus, we're going to get it approved a lot more easily. Can you see if you couch it in that sort of way, your client can you know, possibly accept what you're saying, even though there might be an overall reduction in the value of the development. But if you can explain it to them in that way, that you know, we'll, you'll get... Um, you'll get an e the, the, appro the approval will be a lot easier and quicker and um, clients or, you know, potential purchasers will like it. So that's a way where you might just frame your recommendation to your client in that way. So, um, you know, a lot of uh, good work can be achieved by essentially just pitching it in a way that the client uh, finds uh, attractive rather than you know, than getting their back up. That's just an idea. It depends obviously on the circumstances. Often there's no complete black and white with these things. So here's a second ethical dilemma. You're working in private practice again for a consultancy. A client tells you they have a budget of $5,000 for your firm. You review the work involved and based on your standard hourly rate, you calculate that the budget will only allow a desktop study to be conducted. You believe a site visit is important for you to form a sound opinion, but the client is adamant they cannot budget more. What should you do? Any ideas in this situation? So the client's got a budget and there's something you want to do that is not going to fit within that budget. Could you um, kind of give a few alternatives to, to give them an idea about why it would be better if, if there was a site visit? or um, maybe give them a list of things that they could possibly keep as part of uh, the work that you're doing and then cut out some things and add some other things? Is yeah, that should, bad? Should answer, those are all good suggestions. Uh, give them some alternatives. But if they still say no, what can you do then? You can record everything and make sure that you that it's documented so you can do the report as they like and then just have it documented that they didn't want you to do the other work. Yep. What about the in the report? Like if there's something that's been left out because of the budget? I think you just put it in the report. You say this is what you um, can ascertain from a desktop study but um, to 
to accurately do it, a site visit would be needed and you include it in your recommendations of your report? Yeah, Tonya, that's a really good, uh, you, you basically make it clear in your report that you didn't do a, this is only desktop study, that you haven't had a site visit and you recommend a site visit be done, um, make it clear in your report. So that's uh, a really good um, suggestion. Anyone else? So that's probably the key one, make it clear in your report about the limitations of it. Um, again, this isn't necessarily black and white. So you might just decide to blow it you know, you're going to go out and you'll just wear it. You might talk with your manager and just, if you're developing a long-term relationship with this client, you might wear the cost of, you know, going out for half a day, not bill them for it, go out and do it, and basically do the work anyway, as you think is important because that's who you are as a professional and you just wear it. That might be also something that you do. Um, not you know but that's that's about the long it you know depends on the costs involved the time involved um all of the circumstances but yeah for me i would just wear it um i would go out i i think as soon as i get a a new case the first thing i do um is say to the solicitor you know let's meet the client on site and walk around with them and you know get their views i try and get out on site really quickly do a do a quick desktop study, then get out there and walk around with the client. You learn so much from site visits. And even if they're you know, not paying you for it, it's well worth doing for client relations, building your own on you know, your work profile overall. Um, okay, another ethical dilemma. You're working for the state government. You're working for the state government assessing a project that's been declared a controlled action by the Coordinator General. You believe that the proposal should be refused or heavily modified. The Coordinator General disagrees and is pushing hard for an approval. It's also been very, very vocally supported in public statements by the Premier. Your manager instructs you to modify your recommendations to approve the project. What should you do? No one leaping into this one, are you? <laughs> so this is another hard one. And again, it's not black and white. So you're probably thinking immediately of Simone Marsh's example, but obviously that's a extreme example of, of someone who is incredibly concerned about a huge project or series of projects and basically um, torched her career over it. So you'll face a lot of, you know, there'll be a lot of, times when you know you as an employee can just be told to do something that you disagree with and yeah maybe you document it or maybe you're just told you know if your manager instructs you to basically make you know recommendations one two and three that it you know this project is supported you know to with the attached conditions if the manager is the one that's signing off on it and you're just doing the paperwork it's their recommendation well you're an employee you can be told what to do even if you disagree with it, um, you know, you've given your view, you've been overruled. Sometimes you just, you know, that's just life. That's just working in an organization. Uh, often you'll, you know, work for incompetent managers or, or, you know, people you disagree with and you just get on with life and, you know, you do your best and uh, you don't, you know, if it's not a major um, risk to the community or you think it's just a bad decision, but, you know, no one's going to be killed by it, then, you know, you, you probably don't do anything more than just do what you're told. Um, but yeah, documenting it potentially. But again, you know, documenting it can be um, viewed very unfavorably by your manager because then it becomes uh, FOIable. So often there's no black and white to how you deal with these in practice. Anyone got any comments on that? Shanantha? No? Okay, last uh, problem before we wrap up. You're working for a local government in a development assessment team. The mayor and the relevant councillor strongly support a proposed development that you believe should be refused or heavily modified. You advise the mayor and councillor of your views and they instruct you to prepare an advice to council recommending, contrary to your view, approval of the proposal. What should you do?
Again, no one leaping in to is, answer this. Shinata? If it's if it's similar to the last one, you can state your your opposition, but in the end, you kind of have to go along with it. Yes, is a simple answer. It's you know, if you're an employee, you can be told what to do, and the mayor and the councillor can instruct their planning staff that they want to support it and they want to report supporting it. And again, if it's if it's just your run-of-the-mill development that you disagree with, you think it's a bad planning decision, but you're told to, um, you know, prepare a report. And and importantly, this isn't a report that's going to have your name on it, um, saying that you support it. Like, let's just say you're preparing a report that will go to council. You're effectively doing the paperwork. They just want you to prepare that, and then they will sign off on it. Contrast that, if it's actually got your name on it, then I personally wouldn't put my name to anything that I didn't actually agree with. Um, I think that you need, yeah, I, I would be, if you don't actually agree with it, then um, don't put your name to it, um, you know, as like the author of the report. But it's often not black and white and it's it's rarely an extreme case like Simone Marsh was in. It'll often just be a lot of small little projects that you might disagree with how much do you bend to what you're told to do uh, becomes a, you know, a matter of fact and degree in the circumstances. It's often not black and white. Anyone got any other thoughts or experiences to share? I'm just, this isn't an experience to share. I'm just wondering just for the exams, if questions like this are answered, how can you tell us how you would like us to answer them? Yeah, so fair, <laughs> fair question. Um, these ethical dilemmas are a bit open-ended, um, like the questions on the exam will be pretty obvious. Um, so you'll see in the past exams that we're running, we ran through last week and we'll run through this week, the sorts of questions you get, um, try to make it really clear. So for instance, one question might ask, um, you know, you're working for a local government, you're asked by a member of the public about um, a development application, what can you tell them? Um, explain your ethical duties in this situation. And the answer that I'm looking for there is for you to recognize that you have a duty of confidentiality. You can share with them anything that's publicly available. So for instance, in that case of a member of the public asked about a development application that's been lodged, you can tell them, well, you can go onto the, our website and the application is available um, with all of the supporting documents there. And you could guide them even where to find it uh, so, you know, in that case, you're just doing your job. You're helping a member of the public find out information that's publicly available. There's no, absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's absolutely the right thing to do. You're not telling them anything confidential about it. So simply because you're asked about something that the council or the organisation is dealing with doesn't mean you can't speak about it. It's only, you can only can't speak about it if it's confidential. Does that make sense? So I give you factual scenarios, but it's pretty clear. Um, and there's a not necessarily a black and white answer, but um, it's obvious the you know you've got that that list of um, duties. Um, so I, I want you to be able to identify uh, scenarios where the duties crop up, like duty of confidentiality or potentially corruption or something like that, and be able to give a sensible answer based upon your duties. Does that sound fair enough? Again, we'll, we'll work through it in the tutorial problems. Um, it, it's, um, I just think it's important that we cover these things um, for you. Again, they're often not black and white, but I will make the exam questions fair in the sense that it's clear what, you know, having, um, listen to this lecture and, and having the handout uh, and worked on the tutorial problems, it will be clear to you the sorts of duties that uh, are involved in a particular factual scenario. Does that sound fair? Yep. yep. Yes. Okay. Well, we've gone past 11 o'clock. Um, sorry about that, but I hope you found that uh, lecture useful. And why don't we stop there and uh, wrap up the lecture? Thank you, Chris. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, bye. And talk to you tomorrow in the shoots. Thank you.